That was right. Oh yeah, it was like awesome. I was just feeling it, and I was just ribbing. No song. man, I I don't think you were expressing yourself in the way you think you were expressing yourself. I was like from every pore in my body I, uh, expressing myself. I, I I think you're playing out a key. You aren't expressing. You're just faking it and pretending you're in key. Faking it? More like making it. Just because you don't get it doesn't mean it's not valid. Don't get all esoteric just because you're ill-informed. Why don't you try playing the right notes before claiming to choose the wrong notes? Wrong? This is America, not a fascist dictatorship. I do what I want. Excuses, and people don't want to hear it. You don't want to hear it. Stuff your advice, Sean. You and your stone cold heart. You don't know how I feel. How could you? Was that a Batman the Animated Series Robin's Reckoning reference? Yeah, I have no idea what I was playing, by the way. It sounded like shit. everyone, and welcome to Music Theory Episode 3. This is all about scales today. My name is Sean. My name is Ian. And we're the Bassett Brothers, and let's get started. Started. One of the biggest questions we all want to know is why do some things sound inherently right to our ears and others sound inherently wrong? Nature versus nurture. Sociocultural priming versus harmonic partials and sound waves. Let's skip the science fest today and go straight into the music. So I think we can all agree that our ears tell us what sounds right and what sounds wrong. So in order to discover all these concepts, let's start by listening to our ears. From there, we can reverse engineer why what we listen to sounds good and expand upon that knowledge. We can scale back or forward what we need to know depending on what we discover. Nice. Really nice. Unless you've been living under a rock, you've heard these eight notes in sequence. It sounds good, right? Because your choir teacher in second grade played it, and we know for the rest of our lives this is correct. What are we playing? This is the C major scale. If we were on a piano, we would start on a C and play all the white notes until we got to the next C. What's nice here is we don't need to play a black note, which we will discover someday are sharps or flats. So at the simplest level, we can use this right sounding all white note scale as a start. Inside the C major scale, if we count the black notes we don't play, we can see we move either one or two spaces every single time. From now on, we will refer to these as whole steps and half steps. Half steps are moving one note adjacent, which on a guitar would be one fret. Whole steps move two notes adjacent, which on a guitar would be two frets. So let's use our newfound vocabulary to help break down what is happening in terms of whole steps and half steps. C to D is a whole step. D to E is a whole step. E to F is a half step, F to G is a whole step, G to A is a whole step, A to B is a whole step, B to C finishes off the scale and is also a half step. In sequence, starting from the first note and ending on its octave, we get whole step, whole step, half step, whole step, whole step, whole step, half step, or whole whole half, whole 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 half. That is the formula for the underlying skeleton that makes up our first major scale. Notice anything? Hmm, I bet looking at a piano would help us out right here. Definitely more whole steps than half steps. And those half steps, where are they? Between B and C. And E and F. Memorize, Memorize this. this. It'll make your life easier. Music life. It's also important that when using the scale, we went sequentially from an alphabetical perspective. What does that mean? We don't go C, D, E, some other kind of E, G. It's E. F. Right now that may not make a whole lot of sense, but in the future you'll be tempted by the dark side to do things like that. 
And if you're losing track, just remember that there are more whole steps than half steps. Might not get you what you want to hear, but it makes half step hunting that much easier. So that's it folks, scales done and done. Great episode brother. Yeah, it was pretty easy. Hey, wait a minute, is that a question out there in YouTube land? All right, bring it on, let's see what you got. Hold on, just let, let me explain. We'll get to, just if you could for a minute, back to examples. Well, I don't want to just stand here like an idiot while some ungrateful f Let's randomly check out the key of A minor. Okay, some of you watching know that this isn't random, but let's play along. A to B is a whole step, B to C is a half step, C to D is a whole step, D to E is a whole step, E to F is a half step, F to G is a whole step, G to A finishes off the scale and is a whole step. Skeletor formula? Whole half, whole whole half, whole whole. Boom, minor scale. But wait, there's more. Copy and paste this formula, let your eyes go all magic eye on it, see if you notice anything. Are they related? Why yes, they are! So if the formula stays somewhat the same, but where we choose to start and finish it can be moved to one of these two spots for a major or minor scale, does that mean the scales we choose to put over the top of these formula are related? Yes. A minor is the relative minor of C major. That means their key signatures both contain the same sharps and flats, which in this case is no sharps and no flats. Starting on C and counting in, A is the sixth note. So the sixth scale degree is the relative minor. Conversely, A minor's third scale degree is C, so that is the relative major. Awesome, so we've discovered all the scale formulas that we have to use for the key of C, right? Well, not really, but it's a start. But how does learning scales and scale formulas help us play in key? I mean, aren't scales just those tools that music teachers use to make us practice? Well, you have to practice for this, for this shocking, shocking reason. reason. Scales will give you the underlying notes of a key. These will be the notes that sound right to your ear. And what is right to your ear? Well, this will retain some degree of consonance as you play these notes. Okay, so that was the C major scale. Now with C as the center of gravity, all of the other notes will sound like a member of its family. Those notes are C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and then C again as the octave. Now does this mean that we can't play other notes outside of that scale? No. But that's another show. I know what you're thinking. I tell my ears what to do, not the other way around. Oh yeah, I believe you, I really do. So I'm just gonna play this scale and we're gonna leave it at that. I bet some of you want to punch your screen right now. I kind of want to punch my brother. Yeah, okay, let's try that again. All right, so we stumbled upon something. That completion is really important, right? And we've also stumbled upon the fact that that seventh tone of the scale is now called the leading tone because it has the strongest pull towards the tonic or the B to the C. So B is the leading tone, C is the tonic. Correct the mundo, brother. So there's our introduction to scales. But wait, you only covered two scales in one key. And what about all the millions of notes seemingly that are on my guitar or piano or whatever instrument you're playing out there in YouTube land? Well, fear not. We're gonna have separate episodes for all different kinds of scales. But for now, here's a cliff notes on some popular scales in the Western musical tradition. Harmonic minor. Raise the seventh in natural minor and you will get a leading tone. But notice it's called harmonic minor and not exotic minor. You actually want to avoid the augmented second interval. But we'll cover that a little bit more in harmony. That's another show. Melodic minor. Raise the sixth and the seventh in the minor ascending scale to get a non-exotic jump to the leading tone. While descending, you can play the regular old natural minor. I know this is going to annoy the part of your brain that wants to ascend and descend in the same fashion, but try to think musically here, not, um, pattern, patterny, 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 word, patterny?
modes. Using one scale formula for your base of note choice, but using a different note within the scale as your tonal center or center of gravity. Most guitar players are familiar with modes from a playing standpoint, but not necessarily a melodic standpoint. But you think you do, but you're doing it wrong. No, I'm just kidding. But I'm not, you're misusing the terminology. Pentatonic. This is one of the most important scale types. Almost all cultures that have developed musically have a five note scale. Here in the US, the most popular seems to be the minor pentatonic, which we also use in blues. But this is by no means the only pentatonic scale. But there are many, many more. These were just a few examples we could throw together for today's episodes that had cool title cards in our notes. Relax, my furry little friend. We'll get more into scales as we get more into keys in general. Think of these scales as introductory grammar, which we will soon expand so we can make some cool coherent sentences. Like that one? Hey everyone, thanks for watching. We hope you learned a little bit more about scales and playing in key today. And if you did, be sure to like this video and subscribe to this channel here on YouTube. Also find our website at www.thebassettbros.com, like us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and all that other good social media. And if you liked this video, please share with a friend. We like being around everybody. Thanks a lot. See ya. <laughs> Skeletor formula. Oh, okay. <laughs> Which made no sense. But relax, my furry little friend. You're the free one. That's not in the script. That threw me off. <laughs>